All right, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Wallace. I'm a principal architect with Centric Consulting. Um, make sure that I'm that I've got everything the right the right things focused. I am here locked in the basement of my house. I thought it was a really good idea to build an office in the basement um, because it's normally cloudy where I live, except in the summertime. Today I hear it's nice, but I don't know because I'm locked into the basement. We want to make sure that we uh, that we thank our sponsors and and um, um, and you know include them uh, wherever we can. Um, Amazon Alexa, the software guild, Modus, and Andromeda Galactic Solutions. Um, these types of conferences they just don't happen if uh, if these types of if these types of companies don't get involved uh, and and help us out. This afternoon we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, an event-driven architecture. It's, a, it's an architectural design pattern. We'll get into that a little bit. We're kind of going to kind of go through a, 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 a go through a few uh, go through a few phases. We're going to look at design, where it's going, how it's adapted to the cloud, and then what are some kind of cloud-native or some cloud-specific things that we can take advantage of that can help us when we're designing either an application or an ecosystem and a lot of multiple applications put together. Now, there's no solution that is that is uh, um, that is a one size fits all. Most are a hybrid. So take what you learn. Uh, hopefully you learn something. Uh, combine it with what you already know and the culture in your organization and where you work and see if you can come up with a way to uh, uh, come to where you can ma make some applications. Um, a question that I get all the time is uh, after after I have this 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 talk, you guys actually build systems like this because it, it's very appealing to to computer scientists, to people like me, um, and and possibly people like you. A lot of people are. Do you actually build systems like this? The answer is yes, um, and more and more and more over the last three or four years. Um, as I am involved with larger software systems made up of multiple components, we we face problems all the time: problems of integration, problems of single responsibility, deployment problems, orchestration problems, discoverability problems. And what we're going to talk about today uh, should do a pretty good job at, at, at solving a lot of those problems and give you visibility across uh, across an entire process or across an entire enterprise. There's one thing I want to say about, so I'm a consultant. I work for Centric Consulting. It's a wonderful firm. In fact, I passed my 10-year anniversary this year, so I've been here 10 years. Um, but one thing that we've that we've done as consultancies and as product people even is that we productize patterns of practices. Think of agility. Um, as people became agile about 12 or 14 years ago, more adopted that agile patterns of practices. A lot of consultancies and firms came in and said, well, let's build a product around this. Let's build a set of checklists. That's not what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to give some patterns of practices that will that will influence the way that you design. Uh, that will that will that will influence the way that you design systems moving forward or, and orchestrate processes across across multiple systems. It's not a checklist. It's not a set of technologies. It's, it's a set of patterns and practices and approaches and ways of thinking and approaching a particular problem set. Now, you know, depending on who you talk to, if you talk to uh, uh, talk to the base camp people, you know, they built they built base camp as a monolith. They built uh, they built their new product, K, hey, uh, as a monolith, and you know they speak about the glorious monolith. So there's kind of a debate going on between kind of do I build a system monolith first or do I build a system in a microservices approach first? We'll, we'll kind of define all of these here in a second. Um, and what I've referenced here is two articles from Mountain, uh, Martin Fowler's uh, blog po uh, blog site that that talks about both. You know. Uh, don't start with the monolith or start with the monolith first. Now they're kind of guess approaches, but they're on the same site. So it, it, we have this internal tension. You know, I can get started really quickly if I build from a monolith. But then again, it's something that I know I'm going to have to revisit if I get to any kind of real scale. But let's kind of talk through this discussion here real quick. So we historically, when we build an application, we sit down, we do file new and we build an order processing system. Then as we go, we start to add new functionality like... Maybe we need to start billing for those orders or managing inventory or, you know, uh, we need to have some history. Uh, we need to have users. And now we have to we have a warehouse. Now we have to start shipping. And over time, our systems, uh, our systems get composed and have these different P 
pieces, parts in them. We used to call them modules. You might call them areas. You might call them components. But we have one piece of software that does all of these things. So I have great risk, right? Um, if I want to change anything, I have to, uh, to put it in the production. I have to change. I'm essentially changing everything because I have to put it all into production and I have to test everything. Caused some problems for us. Um, so we, you know, back in the in the 90s, we um, um, started to adopt some other practices. We came up with this thing uh, called uh, called the service oriented called a service oriented approach or SOA um, to account for the fact that monolith first or big giant applications were causing us problems. The older our application gets, the harder it was to maintain. So we decided to make small applications, uh, small. Um, a, a small single purpose or smaller applications, and we would connect them uh, in, in some shape, form, or fashion. Essentially, we're going to build smaller applications. So our monolithic application in this first iteration became a services-based application. So we took all the major components, we split them apart, and now I, I, when I'm working on the order system, I'm working on the order system. Um, I only have to deploy the order system or the warehouse. I only have to deploy the warehouse. If I want to implement a package, I only have to deploy the package. And then what we did was, is we connected them. So if the order system needs something from the to the from the to the logging system or user profiles or warehouse, we start creating all of these connections. Um, and what we would call these is our point-to-point -point connections or, or direct dependencies. And we found ourselves kind of in the same uh, place that we were with our monolithic applications, except now we had the added uh, uh, excitement pain around um, uh, around uh, around this 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 communication infrastructure, be it uh, SOAP, be it uh, uh, be it HTTP of some sort, be it binary connections um, or uh, uh, you know. Uh, um, socket connect binary data over sockets, whatever it was, now I've got this big problem. And we've got a discoverability problem. We start, we, how do you know if you're in order, uh, if you're working in the order system, how do you know where the user profiles are? Well, you might ask your buddy that works on the invoicing system and he says, oh, I have those. So you get those from him and he gets them from profiles and we might, and that could cause a problem for us. Um, I worked on a system for a major, uh, major university, an Ivy League university actually. And when a student, uh, because of this kind of discoverability problem and this sharing data problem, when a student would show up at the university and get their key card for their classroom, it would uh, take two days for it to start working because the data had to be shared. And, and this guy had a relationship with this guy on this system. And eventually the data got uh, got uh, got moved around, got to the key card data and uh, and they could get into the room. That was a minor inconvenience. But an, but uh, uh, another side effect of this of this design. And the way that they approached it was that um, if someone got fired, it took two or three days before their key card would stop working. And that was that was more of a problem. So what we ended up happening was we created a tightly coupled system just as we had in um, uh, in a monolith, except now we've got this kind of HTTP or this network infrastructure in place, which makes it a little a little tougher to uh, a little tougher to troubleshoot and a little tougher to deploy. So we've got some application complexity and some infrastructure complexity. So, so we made another pivot, right, over time. And then remember, this is mostly on-prem. There could be some partner uh, uh, connections here, but this is mostly all in our data center. So, it's, so we solved some of these problems by bringing in a big piece of software and the requisite software development team um, to work on enterprise service bus. And the way, what, what problem this solved for us is that everybody drew a dependency on the service bus and all orchestration, process orchestration was done by the ESB. So um, the order system would ask the ESB universe for a profile, the profile, it might transform some data, it might do some things in the profile data, uh, it grabs the profile data and then returns it back to the order system. Or when uh, someone uh, creates an order, it tells the inventory system to get something from the warehouse and the invoicing system to bill somebody. And then, and, and, and so it knows how to orchestrate those processes. Um, we did, we ended up with some more issues here. Um, we, we had, a, we put a big piece of software. The enterprise service bus is a big piece of expensive software that requires a specialized skill set to work on it. Um, it's not hard if you, if you're a medium sized company 
to have a quarter million dollar bill every year for your enterprise service bus uh, uh, software and hosting, uh, internal hosting, and then another team that is a dependency. So if you that that's that's draws de- that all the projects draw dependency on. So if your order system needs to make a change, they need to tell the enterprise service bus team, and they put it in their backlog, and they may get to it. And then they it may be a little while, but they will get to it. So we we have this dependency. We have dependency on a piece of software that does more than one or two things. It process it, it orchestrates our process. It transforms data. It it manages the moving of information between all of our different subsystems. Um, and we were and it generally in most implementations, um, each individual team supporting individual application does not do the ESB work. There is a centralized team to do that. So really, we now have a more expensive tightly coupled system, but it's kind of better. Um, we've kind of solved the discovery problem. Um, we've kind of solved, um, you know, we have a consistent process and a consistent experience. The, so uh, I'll give you a quote here from Reactive Microservices Architecture. It's a book, page 34. Um, this is the role. And by the way, um, let's see if this works. Whoops. Sorry about that. There's a chair behind me. Tell me that's not in the, you guys can't see that. Uh, but it's 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 an unfortunate uh, name of the fellow that wrote this book, um, but it's a good book. And one of the things that he says is the role of the ESB still has a place, but now in the in the form of a modern scale scalable message queue. So so let's let's use it for what we need to, need it for. Let's not do data transformation. Let's not do um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, customizable process orchestration or or multiple flows. Let's use it as a modern scalable message queue. But if we use it like that, it's, it becomes a very, very expensive message queue, it becomes a very, very expensive piece of software. Um, it requires lots of servers to keep it going. So there's a little diagram here that we've used for a while uh, at my company that's, that's kind of supposed to demonstrate kind of where we are or where we're moving to. From the monolith to client server based applications, web and internet service oriented architectures, um, you know, native applications to cloud, uh, hybrid cloud and web services, and then even smaller microservices, which we're probably we're going to talk about those a lot today and a lot and a lot about functions today. But then we have this this spot on the right, which is lots of little single responsibility software components um, that can that that are very powerful. And that can do some really interesting things for us that can be granular and it can do. So this is kind of where we're going to 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 more pieces of smaller software. And what we're doing is, is we're really trying to get to where we, our applications are really simple to write um, in a monolith. We have a complex application, but simple infrastructure. You know, we might have a couple of web servers, a load balancer and a database server, maybe an app server in between. Um, client server gets a little more difficult as I start to have to put uh, uh, connection strings on client machines, uh, web and internet. I'm going to use a web browser. I'm going to consume services. Now, all the way to the right, we're now building applications that are small, single responsibility, not multi-threaded. They run multiple instances, but the infrastructure is quite complex, especially with the cloud. Um, but we're probably better at building uh, complex infrastructure than we are building uh, complex applications. Um, they're easier to easier to change, but we'll get into more of that. So this is kind of where we are now. If you can see my mouse, and you probably can't. Yeah, we are. We're in this space: microservices and 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 single responsibility functions. So, just for for terminology, everybody has their own uh, has their own uh, definitions. There's there's. I guess supposedly a standard uh, concept of a microservice, but for our discussion today, a microservice is really an independently testable and, de- and, and independently deployable piece of software that can operate uh, in isolation, has has no state dependencies anywhere else, so they're loosely coupled, um, and um, we have and and when we're talking to a microservice, we don't call it directly. Uh, normally, what we're doing is we're passing a message or a message or, an, or uh, some kind of a, an envelope with content and it gets passed uh, to a microservice at some point. Could be a container. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, for our purposes, we also might be integrating a larger package into the system or a third party piece of software or a third party site, give granting access to our world. 
Um, but the idea is that these things are, are, are stateless from my perspective, even though they might maintain some of their own state. Um, they're not sharing databases generally, but sometimes they do. You know, the, remember, uh, this machine has no brain, so you have to do what, what works for you uh, in your instance. Um, and sometimes you might break somebody else's rules. They'll make fun of you, but you know, as long as, as you're working and you meet all the the maxims that we want, deployability, testability, you know, all, all of those things, uh, stateless, um, then you're going to be okay. So, so as we're moving to these smaller applications, these smaller single-threaded stateless applications that we call. Um, uh, uh, microservices is important that we that we make some decisions up front. So we've decided to build the scalable architecture. We've decided to build um, to to uh, use complex infrastructure and simple applications. Um, so what architectural decisions do we have to make? Well, I'm a big fan of putting off decisions until you know more. And if we're at the beginning of a system, we're at the beginning of a migration. We probably know the least now than we will ever. So what can we what decisions can we make that will that will not um, uh, that that are not these decisions are not easy to change? So so what are the fewest number of decisions that we can make that allow us to be flexible in the future? Um, one is we're going to embrace asynchronous interactions. So this is kind of what's going to be in our design DNA right now as we move to these smaller applications. Think about the cloud and then try to pick an architectural design pattern to follow. Asynchronous interactions. Um, we want a, dis a discernible, definable communication pattern, not a hodgepodge. And we need a logging infrastructure. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you please repeat? Sorry, uh, Siri, for some reason, decided to kick in there. Um, and, and we need a logging infrastructure. What, why a logging infrastructure? Because we need to know what's going on everywhere in one place without having to examine everywhere or all the different components that are running. So um, I also like to talk about Conway's law. So basically Conway's law says that your, your hardware and software systems tend to mimic um, the, uh, the org chart in an organization. Or the way that he says it, the basic thesis um, is that organizations that design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. We've been fighting this a long time. Why do we have an accounting system? Well, because we probably have an accounting department. Why do we have a inventory system and a warehouse system? Well, because we have in our org chart, we have two C-level C guys that are in charge of that. Um, what we're trying to do kind of in the, you know, in, in the, um, purest sense of domain-driven design is we're, we're really going to embrace this. Um, we're going to understand that this is how we're going to be organized, that there's going to be software um, that are created and maintained by the different organizations. And they're, they're you know, we're going to buy an ERP and it's going to have accounting in it, maybe inventory management, or we have to build another one. Um, um, so, so this is okay, right? We're going to, we're going to embrace Conway's law. We understand that we're going to build, software that's going to look like our organization. We don't have to fight it as computer scientists. We would say, well, maybe that's not the best way to design. That's, you know, we're, we're one organization and we have to embrace, uh, uh, embrace how, embrace the business and how and the people that we're interacting with and building software for. Um, also, we need to make a system. We need to make architectural decisions um, with testing at the forefront of our mind. We need to make it easy to test. We need to build a system that's easy to test so that we will. I, at crunch time, well, we don't have time to write integration tests or we don't have time to write our, our test automation um, because we're at crunch time. Well, it's, we've got to build systems that it's easy, uh, that it's easy, that it's easy to test. And sometimes the systems that we're going to be talking about are easier to test uh, than to run in a, in a, in a complex environment, which, which means that the best way to verify its its behavior is to is to is to run a test sometimes. Now, a couple of things. Another thing to think about: REST uh, HTTP is not always our friend. Point to point interactions or web servers talking to web servers or uh, or is not all is not always the best the best uh, the best decision that we can make uh, because um, now we've. I think we talked about a little earlier, 
Now we've interacted, we've brought in this whole HTTP stack and we brought it front and center and made it a first class citizen. Um, and we don't, we don't necessarily have to do that. We don't, all of our interactions do not have to be uh, REST or SOAP based. And this hurts me. Um, but one thing that, you know, uh, you know, kind of like when I discovered that relational databases can't solve every problem that I have or not the best solution. Every problem that I have makes me very sad, made me very sad way back when, about seven, eight years ago. Um, um, you know, we've spent a lot of time as architects, as, as system designers, uh, trying to build code that is reusable. And sometimes code reuse is overrated. Sometimes, you know, uh, if you're thinking of, you know, you've heard of dry code, you know, keep your tests, your code dry and your tests moist. Sometimes, you know, we, we have to duplicate code between systems because if we if we reuse the same code, we create dependencies that that, uh, and that that potentially might be unwanted. Now, it's not to say we abandon code reuse. We need to do code. Re we need to be you reuse code deliberately. We can also use that as we design individual applications. As a side note, we can also think about um, the layers in our application and you know, we can be so clever in layering and 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 abstracting out some of the different areas of our application that we make it uh, um, uh, not able to be easily maintained by somebody that's not me. No matter how well I've, docu I've created documentation that nobody's going to read. Um, so just a little aside, uh, we have to address transactions. We have to understand that if I do something here and do something here and it fails over here, I might need to roll it back here and here or have some kind of mitigation strategy. So I have to think about that. And then we have to talk about the client. So the web browser, the mobile application, um, they, they, we generally interact, users interact with, with software systems um, synchronously. I click a button, I get a response. I add something to a shopping cart, clicks buy and it gets and it's purchased my credit card is saved so we've got to account for the fact that while we're still you know connecting all these small software uh, components these little pieces of software asynchronously we still have to um, uh, um, ensure that our client communications you know can can happen appropriately and we have to think about data differently. In the relational models we talked about bef before, um, you know, everybody, all the applications shared one database. Now, the problem that we had, that I've had over and over again, I might have five applications in one database. That means whenever anybody wants to change the database, they have to talk to five applications. And if it introduces a breaking change, then we have to deploy five applications and we slow everything down. But now we've got all these little microservices and they might have their own data store. And eventually that data has to come together. We call that um, eventual consistency. So we're taking our data or our data, there's never one place where I can go and look at all of my data generally, at least not until a transaction is complete. So our data is now is not stored somewhere and then modified. What it is, it's 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 a combination of all the things that are going on in our system at one time. We've got to solve for that problem. We're moving from data at rest or accessing data at rest to data in motion. There might be things happening over here and things happening over here. Um, and, and a, a historical record over here that we have to deal with. So we have to think about this. Um, you know, you'll introduce terms like eventual consistency, where eventually I'll be able to see the data somewhere. <laughs> uh, um, uh, we're uh, doing quite a bit of work for a uh, uh, content curation company um, as we're trying to, you know, in an automated fashion, kind of automatically identify different things and different keywords and tags and and, and and patents and things of that nature. Um, and we've got to bring it all together, but sometimes it's really hard uh, to deal with the fact that everything is in flux. And then I, instead of asking the database for my data, I kind of have to ask my universe, uh, what is the current state of things? We have to think about a scaling model and, and figure out how, how we want to scale. So traditionally, we might stand up. I might need to know, um, well, um, uh, two means one and one means none. So I need two web servers behind a, behind a, uh, a load balancer. 
Um, but at Christmas time, I know that I 10x my throughput, so I need to buy 20 servers or 10 servers or 11, you know, to, to have 10, um, even though 90, 90% of the year I don't need any of it. So we have to think about scaling on demand. And the cloud really makes this possible with a lot of different components. Uh, like, you know, think of, you know, uh, think of Docker containers and Kubernetes and, um, um, you know, think of uh, um, serverless uh, serverless functions and AWS Lambda or Azure functions, um, Azure Service Bus, SNS, um, you know, and, you know, components like RabbitMQ, all these different, um, uh, um, you know, uh, components that allow us to scale very quickly, allows us to get to internet scale uh, and utilize uh, the cloud uh, for what it is, commoditized resources. Have you heard of uh, the notion of, uh, cattle versus pets. Um, we want to treat our services and scale them like like cattle. If it's not behaving, kill it. It's not a pet. It doesn't have a name. Like a server, I don't have to give care and feeding to a server. So we have to give a deliberate thinking uh, to our scaling model. And then monitoring, logging, troubleshooting. How do I? How do I? If 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 something is hung up somewhere, how do I know which service is having a problem? Um, which um, uh, which service is having a problem? How many, you know, where do I need to scale? How much throughput am I doing? How do I troubleshoot? How do I know the status of a particular transaction? We have to think about that and address that. So we, we've looked at kind of some problems, some issues that we have to deal with. We've looked at kind of a scaling model that's cloud-based using cloud components, embracing cloud native things. That's not to say we can't be hybrid and have on-prem stuff. Um, but I want to introduce to you a concept of event-driven architecture. And the event-driven architecture is a computing pattern or, or a design pattern um, that really treats information moving through our system as a series of events. Um, uh, I go back to when I first started uh, uh, my first job of programming a long time ago. We were doing uh, Petzold Windows programming. Um, and, uh, you know, I was able to chug through it because someone would tell me to go change this function. Then we got this thing called VB3. And VB3, there was no start. Uh, there was there was there was no uh you know um uh no main method to start. There was no starting point. The application was bootstrapped, it just started and we responded to these events. It took me a long time uh to figure that out. And event-driven architecture is kind of the same concept but for your enterprise. So now we can embrace domain-driven design. We can embrace um uh, kind of these messaging protocols and treat everything that happens in our domain, be it enterprise, be it a um, uh, bounded context, whatever domain uh, that in which we're looking at as something that happens like new customer, customer submits order. You see a list of them here and we'll go through those through an example a little bit later. Um, so we have all these different events in the system that can occur and the various um, componentry in our system, the various functions, um, packages, um, container, uh, con uh, applications running in containers are simply responding to and producing other events. So, so the events themselves and their payload are designed by the enterprise architect. We're always figuring out what to do with these enterprise architect guys. Uh, are they supposed to be picking packages, doing code reviews, setting patterns of practices? But one of the things that we're suggesting that they're doing is defining an enterprise event model or your application's event model um, and what events happen in what order and how do they transfer, how do they change state? So a few things that are kind of hallmarks of the event-driven architecture. Remember, we're, we're kind of addressing all the points that we've brought up to this point. We're, we're trading application complexity. Uh, we're, we're, we're going from, from complex applications, simple infrastructure to simple applications, more complex infrastructure, uh, trying to get away from these point-to-point -point integrations. Um, we have loosely coupled, highly scalable systems because they're all kind of consuming events. Um, there's no, there's no um, the, the, the event model itself is the orchestration. The individual applications can be run by teams or individuals, as the case may be. These applications are are are, are truly single threaded. We don't have to think about uh, multi-threading or multi-use because we spin up multiples in our scaling model. We'll look at that a little bit later. They're easier to test. 
uh, which means they're easier to change. And that's really what we have to be thinking about when we're designing a, a system. How can we change this as quickly as the business needs it to needs it to change? Um, and then important to a lot of us is that they're technology agnostic. Now we can talk a lot about tech, you know, kind of uh, technology uh, agnostic systems. Um, some people, most people, most infrastructures tend to be homogenous and they stay that way. And, and there are a lot of good reasons for that. But if you find a, a situation where you have to, and this would be way better because there's a super awesome machine learning library that'll only run in Python. Great. We, we can, we can, we can deal with that. Um, you know, we can, we can deal with your, you know, if you have an insurance company and you actually have a bunch of actuaries that are using some, um, uh, some proprietary programming language to do some stuff, we can deal with that. We can bring them into our infrastructure. We're not telling them how to do stuff. We're just telling them how they're going to communicate amongst each other. And that's really what we're deciding here. How are our applications going to communicate? Um, one thing it's that, that I always brought up, I always like modeling systems in a state diagram. And I used to think that, um, that people did, that was the only person who cared. And now Three years down the road, four years down the road, I'm seeing more and more and more systems taking to being modeled in this way. And when I'm thinking about a state diagram, go back to your computer science school um, and a, a an order or an entity in an enterprise or in, in a process really exists in multiple states. We have an entrance state and an exit state and it's and, and the software system does things or responds to things that happens to that event. And, and, and certain combinations of those things, those events that happen to that entity cause you to change state. So you might be in the create order state or the ready to be built state. And there are things that happen that cause you to change state. Now, um, because, but I've got all these individual applications that don't know about state, remember they're stateless. All they know is that they're responding to and consuming other events. Those become the things uh, the order submitted event, the customer build event that you see here, payment received event. Those are the things that are consumed and produced by the various uh, various microservices, um, various software components in some kind of order. OK, and that order tells us the state transition. So now if I have a state diagram and I know the state transitions of my entities of orders, for example, or maybe I'm building a pizza uh, going through a pizza building process. Now I can know where my things are in a process if I'm if I'm if I'm logging them properly, if I'm gaining access to that information that's generated by these processes without you know kind of accessing all the underground uh, things. So we can we can diagram our processes as a state diagram. Now we can start thinking. Now let's start thinking about kind of how we can compose these systems. What components? What pieces? Parts? What kinds of things do we need? And what kind of decisions do we need to make? So we can look at you know some components we may talk about. One of them let's talk about uh, is an API gateway. An API gateway uh, provides a way for um, uh, for kind of the users or other components or third parties to gain access to our world um, um, in a kind of a synchronous way. They make a request and they receive a response. I'll give you an example. So I've got all these clients. I've got my, my uh, uh, API gateway, but behind the API gateway are AWS Lambda or Azure Functions, and they spin up one per each request. So every time somebody makes a request to that Lambda, a new instance, its own memory and everything, own state is spun up. So client makes a request, spins up a function, the response comes back. Um, next client makes a request, the function spins up, the request comes back, and so on and so forth. All right. Now there might become an there might come an instance when you know the client comes on. I've got these functions that exist out here. The client makes a request, and the function needs to maybe need to talk to another function uh, to orchestrate a process. Okay, so if we do this, all right, we've got a problem. If we have functions calling other functions. Uh, trying to figure something out or one microservice calling other microservices directly. We've got the point to point problem again with added with more complexity than we than we brought in uh, when we had SOA and even more complexity than we had when we when we brought in uh, the ESB. So what we're doing is we're making some rules here. Even if we're coming in, if the client's coming in in this way, what we're going to do is we're going to put an event stream 
under the function un, un, that manages the passaging of messages between the function. So what we're saying here is as a rule, clients come in through this API gateway. It's an API that we don't gateway that we don't write. It's one that we configure. It fronts functions as an example, could be something else, could be a website. Uh, and, but so when people talk to us, they use, they, they come out through this API gateway. But when we talk amongst each other, we always use the event stream. Okay. So that's the first rule that we have in this kind of microservices approach. The example here is function as a service is that our components on our, in our enterprise communicate with each other via some uh, event stream. Okay. And um, the event stream that we'll talk about two today, um, but the one we're going to talk about first and, and it's where we get we send most of our work into our demo is a check in time here is a, uh, is a, uh, is a pub sub. Uh, event stream. So essentially in a pub sub world, um, we've got um, all our different components. Remember, this is our example from before with orders, invoices, inventory, logging, profiles, reporting should be kind of reflective uh, over a real system. All the systems are passing and pa are, are creating events and consuming events from the event stream. And then each of the other components are consuming events that other functions created. We'll walk through this here, here in a second. Um, but as you can see, it's loosely coupled. The event stream is infrastructure. It's software, yes, but it's really more like a server or a communication protocol. Um, so it's not doing orchestration. It's simply managing the routing of events from one component to one or more of the, uh, uh, of the other. Um, one of the benefits of kind of this world is, is that if you want to integrate a new system, you don't have to call the ESB team. You don't have to integrate, uh, you know, get an integration team together. All you have to do is add the new system and have it start consuming events and producing events if they already exist. So integration is very quickly. Also, um, testing is very easy. So you can have version two of the profiles of the profiles component out there, start consuming the same events for testing purposes. Um, it really helps. Uh, it really helps to be able to use do against live events. You just got to make sure it's not generating other events that are consumed by by V1 software. Um, the model scales. So, for example, if I'm generating event A and I've got 10,000 event A's out there and they're queuing up, they're getting in a big line. Uh, remember, we go back to our scaling model. So somehow we just, you know, if the inventory processor is falling behind, we just spin up more inventory processors. In a, in a serverless world, it, that this happens automatically. It gets spun up automatically. But in, you know, in the, in the uh, um, Docker container world, you know, we might have to create some rules in our scaling engine that allows us to scale appropriately to, you know, keep, we keep so many warm and we scale up as we need to. We're dealing with this data in motion concept. So all the events, all the events that are generated are, are logged one, but also our business intelligence or our data, our business intelligence systems or data and analytics systems can also be consuming those events. If they're consuming those events, they know real time what's going on. So they, if these events all are dumped into the data lake and they're processed on whatever, uh, whatever schedule they have or, or automatically logged, then we know in real time what the heck is going on. And the business intelligence or the data analytics guys don't have to know where all the databases are. They don't have to connect to the orders database because it, um, they don't have to connect to the invoicing for, to the invoicing system. All they have to do is consume the events um, that inform it on, on the process of uh, uh, the processes of what are happening. Um, um, I double checked this approach uh, a year or two ago with our own data and analytics team. And I asked him, man, I got a problem here. Now, I already kind of had an answer. Um, I said, you know, we've got a problem here. Um, you know, the data analytics uh, team is still pulling directly from these databases, from these systems, and it's causing a problem. We've got a tight dependency or a, a tight coupling. We've drawn some dependencies um, on database changes. And he says, well, why don't you start consuming, just start consuming the events? I'm like, yes, that's right. That's exactly what we want. That's why this system, that's why this system works. Now, if I have business and in, uh, business intelligence on this process way earlier than I used to, I can start identifying things. My data is not out of phase and my business intelligence teams can be, can be adding features at the same speed as everybody else. It's easy to, you know, we've talked about ease of third-party integration. Um, if you have an existing system, uh, we did a system for a manufacturing organization, 
um, and they had a manufacturing system. All we did, we had, we wrapped their system or adapted it. We implemented what we call an adapter, loosely based on the adapter uh, enterprise design pattern. And, and all it does is know how to talk to our infrastructure and talk to that system. That's all that it does. So it draws no other dependencies on it other than that. Um, we can scale however we want to. We can scale, you know, depending on the cost, we can scale from zero to infinity, depending on the, the, the number of messages that our, um, our event stream can support. Um, it's fault tolerant. If a message is not processed in a certain amount of time in the pub sub model, it can be reissued. We can have dead letter queues or dead letter places where this can be message can be dropped and looked at. Um, if we look at the messages and we log the messages based on our state diagram and we see all the messages in order that happen for a particular um, uh, for a particular entity as it moves through its process, um, we can now look at the status and we can see what happened. We can roll back and replay based on that information, and we can test this subsystems in isolation. These these functions, these uh, these these uh, 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 microservices can all be tested independently. So let's go through kind of an example. This is kind of a retail system. Um, if you notice here, what we have in this world is that we have two. External partners, one external partner is consuming an API and we've adapted one another external partner. We have an ERP, we have some production systems, very loosely based on a manufacturing system we worked on. So let's say a user is going to uh, is, is going to buy something, right? So what happens is the user goes onto the website and says, I'd like to buy something. And the web and in and, and this world, the web API um, uh, the API is connects to the event stream. It also connects to a database. That's an option. Remember, nothing's nothing's ideal. Um, I click the button. Um, so we'll walk through this here in a second. Now it, it, we can overlay the technology stack. Um, in this respect, you know, in this instance, and and I'll show you an example of this a little bit later. Um, is this built on you know um, Azure static site hosting for the web UI? We're not talking about web servers here, Angular, SQL Azure, but you can draw these same technologies in AWS or Google Cloud uh, or Heroku for that for that matter, and um, um, drop a different database. The architecture design patterns are the same. Remember, we talked about this being technology uh, technology agnostic. We're trying to use a design pattern that will work in lots of different organizations or in lots of different ecosystems. So the user creates, buys something, it goes to the website uh, to order my new widget. The API says, I need to, I, they created a new order. So it, they generate a new order created event. It goes into the event stream, right? So we're clear. I click the button, I click buy. It connects to the API. A new order is generated, sent to the event stream. And the Invoicing system, the logging system, and the adapt the the uh, ERP system all consume that same event. So it's not sequential. Remember, it's asynchronous, and it's also not it doesn't have to be sequential. These three um, services are consuming the exact same event. Okay, um, and this is how we get process orchestration out of the event model, out of the state diagram, not out of the event stream. So the invoicing system, the logger, and the adapter consume uh, these events. The invoicing systems generates a customer build event, says, hey, I build the customer. And the production system says, I'm going to have to make something because someone's been billed. We've got the money. I've got to go print it or I've got to go build it or I've got to go manufacture it. The RP system says, OK, acknowledged. And the logger says, all right, I know what the next thing that happened was. So we were in the production system. We're in the, the factory. We're building something. And the production system says, hey, I produced the item. And the shipping system says, oh, I better create a shipping labor. The warehouse says, hey, I've got one. And the logger says, acknowledged. All right. So you see how this is going um, for these events. Shipping system says, hey, I ship the event. The, uh, the order ship event is generated. Um, the ERP system is notified. The warehouse checks it off the list. Uh, the API tells the, the, the web UI or the user, hey, or sends a text message or whatever and says, hey, this thing is is on its way. It's shipped. It's on its way to your house. 
Now, what we have here is because the event stream is simple, it scales very well. It can handle millions on millions of messages for little or nothing in, uh, um, as far as the number of transactions that it, that it can process. So all, it's for, all, all it does is it, it, it is, the, is the placeholder for events or the, the, um, the Dropbox for events, and then it distributes the events to the people that connect to the, to the various events. It's important to notice for our logging purposes that the logger consumes every event. So I can go and say, give me all the events for order ID 1234. And you will see all the events for order ID 1234. Or I can ask, hey, tell me all the events that are in process, that are in phase manufacturing. Um, do I have a bottleneck in the production system? Uh, give me all the events uh, that are waiting to ship. Give me all the events and you see what's, you know, kind of what's going on. That's taking more than three days to process. Uh, you know, we can do that with the information from these events. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a couple of minutes and I'm going to kind of show you. Let's see. I'm going to share a whole screen here. So I will... Um, apologize. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to see everything that's there. All right. So what we have here, if you notice here, we've got we've got all these different we've got these different components. We've got our we've got a shipping consumer, warehouse consumer, logging consumer. So these are the applications that we have. These applications uh, are operating this ecosystem, and the only thing that's common amongst them is how they connect to to the event stream. So what they do is they wire to the event stream and they're saying, hey, give me, um, uh, bind me to any messages that come in of this particular type. And in this instance, they're all the messages. Uh, if I look at the invoicing consumer, um, we're saying the invoicing consumer is saying, hey, uh, bind to uh, the order accepted event. Anytime there's an order accepted event, send that event to me and, and I will run uh, and I will run on it. So what we've got here is a pub sub model, uh, event, event driven architecture um, using RabbitMQ. I, I'm using RabbitMQ uh, because it'll run on my laptop. <laughs> um, it's 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 um, uh, AMQP. Um, uh, it's it's a it's a standards based protocol, so you can use AMQP with Azure Service Bus with uh, SNS. Um, so this is just an example that will run. Also, RabbitMQ is a fine pub sub a pub sub approach. So then it consumes the message, and whenever an, a message comes in, then it's going to execute uh, this processor, which it processes the event and and does some stuff. All right. So it's it's really quite the code is really quite simple. I can have one little service that I can test independently. I can generate messages through code very easily. So this little system I can deploy as a Docker container in a Docker container, which is what I'm doing right here because I want it all to run on my local machine um, pretty easily. Um, I can run it as a Docker container. I can run it as an Azure function by creating just another application, and I can follow all the same patterns of practices that I'm normally using with applications with testing and things of that nature. Um, so, so what I have here, and let me spin this up. This is the only thing that I can't change the size of. I just created this. This is for instructional purposes and the link will be uh, in the deck and you'll be able to download the code if you like. Um, um, basically I've created a, uh, a using Docker Compose to spin up X number of uh, uh, X number of, of, of these consumers, um, right? So you can see them all running here. Um, also, just for demo purposes, there's a little little database, a little SQL Server database running in a container as well. Hopefully, you can see that. So what I'm going to do is we're going to look at our RabbitMQ. So these are all the queues that we have stood up. What I'm going to do is is um, I've got a little another little application here that'll generate. Uh, events or uh, that are generated events. So remember, the entrance into our system is this new order, is a new order generated uh, event. So I can, I'm going to run this. I'm going to generate a hundred um, new orders real quick. And what you'll see here is, you'll see them start to spin up here in the queue. So look at the queues here. You see that I'm going to generate a hit. Uh, 
generate a hundred orders and you should see them start to pop up in these queues. Not, you know, I just want you guys to see what this code looks like and how it's operating. This example, all these services are running a single instance Docker containers. So I'm generating, I'm sending all these orders, orders accepted. And you should start seeing these orders start to come in. You can see them processed here by the different, uh, by the, by the different functions. There's a different way to get in there uh, to, to look at those. So if you, in, in this instance, I'm just looking at um, logging consumer as an example. I can see the events coming in specifically for that, for that event right here, for that event processor right here. Um, so now if I'm looking at these queues and the order in which things are processing, I can start to see some bottlenecks occur if I'm going to scale manually. So uh, give you an example. I'm going to stop the system and I'm going to go back to my code. And I'm going to, you know, we've got a bottleneck, let's say, and I'm going to spin up uh, 10 of the warehouses and 10 of the shippers. Um, you'll see all that in the code. So now I'll, I'll see more, more of these components come online here. As you can see, they're created and they're waiting to come online. So now I've got a whole bunch of more processors uh, going on processing these, these different events. And I should start seeing these checked off very, very quickly. Okay. Now, or much or more quickly than they were. Now, one thing I also wanted to demonstrate. Now, this doesn't have to be single, it's kind of single, uh, single use processing orders. Um, now we can also look at this process of, uh, say, um, uh, ETL process. Um, um, I'm bringing a bunch of customers in. I'm loading them from another system. Well, typically, historically, we might, you know, load them into a CSV file and run them through some processes and load them directly into a database. So now we've got a, a situation where we have two separate sets of user uh, rules uh, or, or uh, business rules running, potentially one in the database and one in the application. What I could do is I could take that big file of customers and break it apart and create events at them and dump those onto the on, onto the um, onto the event stream and let them be processed as normal. And that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to generate 100 uh, new customer events from another system, and it just drops right into the system. I'm going to generate 100 new customers, and you should see the customer queue cart start to spin up here with these, with these customer orders or these customers starting to come in. This should update every uh, 91, 90. It'll start, you start to see them count down. Now, the nice thing, too, about these queues is that they will also <laughs> – um, uh, integrate with most of your uh, uh, systems manage most of your systems management or logging infrastructure. Okay, so it's it's just an interesting thing to to look to look at and to test various scaling models, um, functions, and the way that we can you know kick those off. Um, let me start this here real real quick again, and. And then I'll reconnect to the presentation. All right, just a couple more slides. So we've talked about the pub sub model, but you know, um, products like uh, you know uh, that support an event sourcing model, which is kind of different from a pub sub model. It's actually very cool. Um, I haven't implemented any systems, any large scale systems, uh, using an event sourcing approach. Uh, it's still an event-driven approach, but the way that it deals with events is a little bit differently. So in an events, in event sourcing mode, the events are mutable. Think kind of like very blockchain-y. Um, so the, the event system consumes each event. They cannot be changed. The event describes the action that could be granular, like first name changed or, or new order created, right? Um, the... Um, it, this is really where you see an eventually kind of a consistent world uh, come into play in this event sourcing world. Um, um, you, your read, your write, and read structures are totally different. So you might use a product like, like, um, um, oh, of course I've for, forgotten the name, but like, um, like Kafka uh, to consume the events, and then you then eventually you know you rebuild your read structure. So you have eventually consistent data, and that kind of embraces the CQRS. Uh, world at the enterprise level, command query uh, response segregation. Um, very popular um, is a tool like 
uh, like Kafka that does that. But essentially, I've got my services that publishes an event. The event store is the logging infrastructure, essentially. And then eventually, the read store is updated. I, I you know, I, I, uh, we've done this on, on a small scale with, with smaller subsystems um, and dealing with a larger event that has a lot of writes. Um, and we don't want to kind of tie up our write store with our read store. And it's not that important, you know, 30 seconds later that the, the read data is, is updated is, or 10 seconds later is, uh, is seemingly appropriate. But it's, it's worth looking at as you kind of figure out how you're going to consume your events, how you're going to get to Internet scale if you are an Internet scale company um, and, and how you can uh, look at an event sourcing model as, an, as a way to implement an event driven model. Now there are a ton of uh, um, ton of books out there. Um, you know, I was introduced uh, several years ago to this guy Stephen Norberg. So you know, he's got some presentations out there. This presentation is at that place. You can look for me on GitHub, Sean E. Wallace on GitHub, and there is a, a repo EDA dash RabbitMQ that shows you this particular code. There's actually another one. Uh, um, that I'm that I'm not done with. Um, that's that's converting this to be all Azure functions. The problem with with uh, RabbitMQ is that with you got to go to third parties to be able to trigger Azure functions with RabbitMQ. So I'm still working on that. Um, so there's a lot of different articles here. Um, don't think that this you know there's a lot of people that try to discourage you uh, from a, 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 from taking an event driven approach. Um, uh, it's it, it takes a long time to understand. Once you understand it, you get it, and you're like, oh yeah, this is how I should be doing things. I really, I really can think inside of a particular context. Uh, if you need to get a, if you want to get in touch, in touch with me, and this is a QR code to the GitHub repo. Um, I'm Sean Wallace uh, on Twitter at Sean Wallace, and uh, I appreciate your time today. Um, again. Please, please re remember our sponsors and the people that we've talked to uh, that they're supporting us and making this available. Uh, I'm really impressed with the way that this event has gone on, um, but it is five o'clock on Friday and I will not uh, pontificate. Um, I will open it up to any questions if anybody has any questions. If not, again, thank you for attending. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully you're getting, you're, you're kind of helping you get down the road. And I, I really hope you have a great night and a great weekend and everybody stays safe.